I really enjoy solving problems and, and helping people. And uh, being the plant electrical engineer lets me do that pretty much every single day. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation I'm very excited to have with us, my friend Mike Tricario, and he is the plant electrical engineer at Certainty in Oxford, North Carolina. So welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Man, I'm glad to have you, buddy. It's, uh, we've known each other for several years, and uh, I had to uh, twist your arm a little bit to get you to come on, but I'm so glad to have you here, my friend. Yeah, I'm glad that we can finally make this happen. Last year was a bit of a busy year for me, personally and professionally, so I'm, I'm glad I was able to set the time aside. Yeah, no doubt. We're going to get into some of that. But, Mike, just to, to get us started, we'd love to hear your personal story, your journey to the role that you're in right now. Yeah, it's a bit of an accident, maybe even serendipitous. I graduated college in 2010, and obviously the recession of 2009 kind of carried over, and there wasn't many opportunities at the time. And for a friend of a friend, I was able to, to get a position basically running a eBay account and basically being a chauffeur and driving people to and from the airport for a, a small little 12-employee systems integrator. And I did that for about eight months there. And they signed on a couple of big projects, and they got really busy all of a sudden. And they basically asked me if I was interested in doing more of engineering work. They knew I had an engineering background. So I got involved with HMI development, and then after the the first project, they offered me full time to come on as a service engineer. So that was working seven days a week, traveling about uh, 80% of the time or so, which is great experience. The long term, it definitely takes takes a toll on you. And uh, after about two years, the the company was acquired, and there was a lot of uncertainty about the future. So there, there was a lot of turnover. And that's when I started looking for, you know, opportunities elsewhere. And I, I applied, interviewed, and uh, got hired here at Certainty in, in Oxford, North Carolina, and, and kind of came down and started off originally as a, a process engineer. It's what I was originally hired for. And that role lasted for about six months. And then they approached me about coming on as the electrical maintenance supervisor for the facility, which I had never done a management or supervision before in my young career. So I thought it was a good challenge and a good opportunity. And it was a good experience. It was fun. It allowed me to really learn a lot about the business, about the industry, about the process. And after a few years of that, I was wanting to get more back to the engineering side of things. And I moved into the, the role I'm in today as the, the plant electrical engineer. And I still work very closely with the maintenance team uh, in the engineering team as well. Very cool, man. So you're the plant electrical engineer, but I didn't realize, so you had done the maintenance manager as well at certain team? Oh, so a supervisor. So I, I reported to the maintenance manager in that role. But yeah, I was responsible for the electrical maintenance. So I had 11 electricians reporting to me, and we were responsible for the electrical maintenance for the entire facility, which is three rock crushing mills, raw material processing center, and at the time we had seven production lines. Right. Now, if I remember correctly, too, in the site that you're at, the, the plant there, one of the largest shingle manufacturers, is it in the country or in the world? It's pretty massive. Yeah, it's unverified, but it's just passed down. So we, we joke that it's the largest shingle plant in the universe because we're assuming there's no more out there outside of Earth. So <laughs> That's right. That's right. It, it is impressive, man. And as the, the plant electrical engineer, when you're looking in the future and things that are changing, what challenges do you see coming down the pipe that you're going to have to address in the coming years? So for here, this was one of the first certainty greenfield plants that they, they built in roofing. And they, they opened it up in 77. And we started in like the last maybe two years or so. We've had some employees that came on in 77 at 18, 19 years old starting to retire and it's a really good place to work so we have a lot of guys that have been here you know 30 40 years even 
And as they start to move on to the next chapter, next phase of life, and they take a lot of that experience, knowledge with them, and it's going to be very difficult to replace. No doubt. We're hearing that across the board, Mike. Workforce attrition, it is happening. That knowledge leaves and it doesn't come back in. How are you addressing that? Are you trying to do more mentoring while you have that that knowledge there now? Yeah, some mentoring. We've seen a push and and a a desire to explore some of these newer technologies that are out there to see if, if that can supplement some of the retention of this information. So We've, we've started incorporating like tablets on the floor in, in the past year or so, and we're involved with some pilot projects coming down the pipeline now that are involving the Microsoft HoloLens, like the, the augmented reality glasses. So I think they're trying to kind of capture some information using some of these tools to help the transition to the next generation that's going to basically uh, you know, keep this place operating. Wow. So you guys are actually using some of the holo glasses in your plant right now? Not yet. It's still very infancy stages. There's some safety concerns that need to be addressed and I think some connectivity issues, but they're trying to explore it as a potential tool to retain this because you can get some first person video footage with hands free essentially. And then in in addition, you can overlay some information and, and build some applications with it as well. That's very cool, man. That's exciting times. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And like the shingle process hasn't changed much since about 1903. So it's a you know, unique uh, situation bringing some of these newer tools in. Yeah. And I, I guess uh, back to the last question about the challenges is, is as manufacturing, as we introduce this technology and as, as things get more automated, it changes the requirement skill set for some of the, the technicians and, and the personnel at, at the facility to be able to make all this stuff work every day. Right, right. No doubt. We're trying to also, Mike, inspire people to come to industry. You're a young plant electrical engineer. If you could sit down with someone in engineering school right now and give them some advice to to really walk them through what they need to know about industry that they're not being taught, what would some of that advice be? That's funny. So when I was in that position in school, my department chair at the time basically told us that manufacturing in America is dead. It's going to all be outsourced. You're competing with a bunch of engineers from India and China. And a little that I know, within a year, I'd be working for uh, someone who basically serves the manufacturing industry. And now I'm, I'm working you know, in a manufacturing facility now that produces quite a bit of product. And I never really thought about how shingles are made until I walked into this plant. And uh, I guess for a lot of things, is you have all these uh, materials you know, in your home or in your possession. And sometimes you don't really consider how much goes into you know, making that complete item or widget. And uh, there's so many different parts of the process that, that require engineering that, that you can get involved with. And it's some of it's beyond what you can possibly imagine as far as what it takes to make something or, or what goes in to make something happen. No doubt. So it sounds like to me that professor back then may not have been exactly on course because there's a lot of opportunity, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And especially just here in Oxford, you can see what an integral uh, part of the community the manufacturing uh, sector here brings as far as the employment opportunities and then the giving back to the community. It's really a, a nice relationship to see. No doubt, my friend. For the, the people that aren't familiar with shingle manufacturing, is there a high-level overview you'd like to give of just maybe how the process sits from a bird's eye view? Because you guys do it from soup to nuts, right? The whole process is done underneath your roof. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We bring in a fiberglass mat and rolls, and the you know, the main component to the shingle is uh, an asphalt mixture. It's a combination of asphalt and limestone, and you know, we bring in an asphalt derivative here and process it on site. We bring in rail cars of limestone rock that we, we crush uh, on site and mix those to, to make the base layer of, of the shingle, and then we basically coat it with the granules, which will give it that nice aesthetic look that you on other people's roofs. And, and that also adds UV protection because if the asphalt gets hot enough without it, it'll obviously deform a bit. But then we basically cut it down to, to size, stack it in a, a bundle and, and wrap it in some plastic and throw it on a pallet. And if you are getting shingles put on your roof, that pallet would show up in your driveway and straight from the, the end of the palletizer, basically. So it's, yeah, from start to finish, all, all in, under one roof. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a lot goes into it to make it happen, and it's a very intricate process and a very connected process. So there's a lot of 
potential points of failure or, or things that can derail the whole process. Right. And I do know, since I have experience working with you directly, it's a good business to be in, apparently, because every time I come there, I'm like, it's tractor trailers lined up for, it seems like a mile coming in and they're going out at the same rate of speed. It, it's great for the community, as you mentioned, to have that type of business and infrastructure and opportunity for people like yourself to go to work and enjoy it and have some fun and make a real difference in the world. You know, it's really nice. And obviously, the close proximity to the Raleigh-Durham area, which is growing and, and they're building housing all over the place still, and it helps keeps us busy. And like I said earlier, you know, we're, we're a pretty large facility. And if we had to, if we were running full capacity, I think we can provide roofs for a third of America. Right. <laughs> Wrap your head around that if you're listening, what he just said. It's unreal. So the, the type of capability underneath that roof is phenomenal, Mike. You, you're, you're working at a fun place. And, you know, I would like to talk a little bit about you. And you've, you've shared with us about your career. Have there been people that have helped you along the way, from like a mentor standpoint, that you look back on and you can really feel like they care about you? Any, anybody stand out? Uh, it's, uh, I've had a fortune enough to have several along the way in, in different phases. At my first company, my, my first boss, he, he basically taught me everything I know about PLCs. Because coming in, I, I didn't mention when I went to Binghamton University, I got a degree in, in bioengineering. I never thought I'd, <laughs> I'd be an, an electrical engineer by title. And I, I didn't know a whole lot. You know, I had some programming experience, but never with control systems or, or PLCs or anything like that. I didn't know how to read a schematic or, or write any ladder logic, and uh, he had a lot of patience and let me fumble through it a little bit, and uh, yeah, I was able to learn quite a bit from him. And then coming here to the, the plant in Oxford, we had a few people who have since retired. The first couple of years I was here, we were able to work together, and a few of them had, two, two in particular, had probably combined 40 uh, plus years of experience specifically in the roofing industry and I got a lot of insight into the the, the process and how it all folds into uh, the bigger picture and it just helped me put things in perspective a bit mm -hmm. no doubt so it sounds like you had some really good people speaking into your life throughout your professional career yeah, I've been pretty fortunate at, at each stage there seems to have been someone closer available to me uh, to help help guide me and, and talk through certain things. Yeah, no doubt. Speaking to that attrition thing you were talking to earlier about with people leaving, have you found a chance to mentor others or to try to help other people understand things about your professional career or help them along the way at this point? Yeah, we've had uh, a couple young engineers get, get hired in the, the last few years, and I'll you know, spend some time with them explaining the electrical control side of things of how, you know, how they work here at the facility and we, we partner with our corporate team with a it's a post-grad program essentially called essentials of manufacturing if you're out there getting ready to graduate in the spring it's something we're looking into it's a saint gobain program which is certainty's parent company and uh, they usually hire about 30 people into that program and we participated it's a two-year program and basically we go and we interview all of these potential candidates there's about i think 25 plants that are involved and we were one of them and then we divvy up the individuals we seek their preference for where they want to go and then we put our preferences for the particular candidates that we have interest in and then we, we try to match as close as as possible and so we were able to hire on an individual through that program that's been with us since i guess october they're originally going to start in, in July of last year, but you do the coronavirus restrictions, and, and we had some internal travel restrictions and things like that. They decided to postpone it a little bit, but I've been working very closely with that individual, kind of bringing them up to speed as far as manufacturing and, and the role of a of electrical engineer in, in a facility like this. Now that, so that program was called, just to recap for listeners, The Essentials of Manufacturing? Yes, through St. Cobain, which is a parent company of certain teeth. Okay, yeah, we'll put that out there. and There may be people listening that want to learn more about that program. It sounds like it was an amazing opportunity, for sure. Yeah, we've had a couple of people come in through that or program in the past. It's evolved over the years, and they speak pretty highly of it. And I've had a fortunate opportunity to network with some of the other individuals in the organization through other projects, and it's a really cool opportunity. For sure. Sounds like it, man. Thanks for sharing that. Now, 
What about when you're looking at the future for the plant and what you're working on? What gets you excited? What projects out there? You've already mentioned a couple with the uh, the tablets and the hollow glasses, but what types of projects are, are coming in the pipe that gets you really pumped up? Those are excited, exciting in their own regard, but a lot of it's just tackling the obsolescence, which is you know allowing us to increase some of the uh, processing power available to us in certain processes. For me in particular, the obsolescence coming into a facility opened in 77. We've had a couple of passes at it where we have had different levels of upgrades and technology introduced throughout the years. So it's uh, an eclectic mix of four decades worth of different technologies and being able to have a say and, and decide how, how we're going to move forward with, you know, with upgrading it and bring it into what is considered state of the art uh, is fun. And then it gives us a little bit, maybe a little more control over the process or more recently, it gives us access to, to data that we never had before. So it, it provides more insight into the process than we've ever had in the past, which kind of helps us do our job a little better as engineers and helps us make better informed decisions on how to improve things. Yeah. So it kind of sounds like some of those modernization projects, man, they're coming up and you're going to be at the front of a lot of them, which could be a, a fun and exciting time. Oh, absolutely. Very cool, man. So we're trying to inspire people, Mike, to, to come to industry. You provided some great advice earlier, but taking another approach, what we love to do is debunk myths. People think, when they think of manufacturing, sometimes they have this overview in their mind that's just completely wrong, man, because you know how, how things really are. So if there are a, is, is a myth out there that you'd like to debunk about manufacturing or your industry in, in specific, what would that be? I think... Uh... For myth, I, I, I guess maybe people might not realize how much tech is involved and, and how advanced some of these automation systems can be with the introduction of uh, servo motors and vision systems. And it just, it's crazy how much you can increase productivity with just a little bit of technology. And there's some things that, you know, issues or long-term issues that we had fought for years where all of a sudden a new piece of technology comes along and it solves some pretty significant problems. And I don't know if people are aware of you know, all that's available out there and what goes into manufacturing as far as uh, some of these newer technologies. And it's just something you, you don't really think about every day. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I didn't know how a shingle was made. And then after seeing it, I'm still just like you know, amazed how many we can just put out the door every day. Right. How about another question dovetailing on that? And then we'll get off the, the work stuff. When you find that you're the, the happiest, Mike, and you're doing the work that you enjoy, you're you got a smile on your face. What are you doing in those moments? What's what gives you that fulfillment? Oh, <laughs> it's like a two-step process. So, like I said, I work closely with the maintenance department. So, you know, whenever an upset condition occurs, we, we'll usually we'll, we'll get a small team together and go over who knows what's not working the way it's supposed to. What have we tried so far and kind of game plan for the, the troubleshooting steps of, you know, how, how we're going to approach getting out of the situation. And when it finally does click and you're able to get over that hump and get things working again, that's usually a pretty good feeling. Being able to solve the puzzle and get back to that, that running state and, and getting everything back to the way it was is a nice feeling. No doubt. And then, yeah, and then additionally, obviously, when, when you're doing a an upgrade, when you're bringing something to a you know, a new, newer piece of equipment or, or a better piece of control, just seeing the benefits of that and, and seeing how it helps the operators do their job better or, or safer, it, it's a nice feeling being able to help people. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, Mike, let's get off the, the career and let's talk a little bit about you outside of work, man. How about that? Okay. So, man, what do you enjoy doing for fun? Any hobbies or anything like that? I, I had quite a few hobbies uh, and then I, then I had two kids. And so my, my, my daughter's uh, two, two and a half. My son's about eight months now. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's definitely tiring at times, as I'm sure any anyone with kids could could attest to, especially with everything else going on in, in the world these days. But yeah, I, I try to spend as much time as I can with them uh, outside of work and just playing with them. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah, no doubt, man. So how about when they get a little bit older, do you, go, do you like stuff outside and doing outdoor stuff or anything like that? Yeah, I like to try to get out. One of the nice things about living in the Raleigh area is there there are a lot of parks and greenways to get out and take a bike ride or go for a walk. And there's a, a couple of different lakes and 
you know, rivers where you can go, got a kayak, go put in and get it on the water for a couple hours. It's also an, an afternoon sitting on the beach is, is always nice, which is only about a two hour ride. So that, that's I try to do that a couple of times in the summer. There you go, man. There you go. And you'll be a sandcastle king before too long, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> Now, you mentioned, so your daughter's two and a half and your son is eight months old. So is your family, the rest of your family, are they up in New York? No. My wife and I, we met my freshman year of college, and we stayed together. And I was traveling a lot with my first company uh, when she got her, her master's degree. And then she moved to North Carolina for a job, actually. So I, I actually followed her down here back in 2013. And before I knew it, both my siblings moved to, to the Raleigh area. My parents retired to Brunswick County a few years ago. And uh, my wife's sister also now lives in the uh, Fuqua Verena. <laughs> so wow. they just, so we came down to not knowing uh, what to expect and trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to split Christmases up, traveling back and forth? And little did we know that the whole family was just going to follow us. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's so good. That's so good. Yeah, it's nice, especially with the two young kids. Having family nearby is, is a huge helping. No doubt. No doubt. Now, is your wife's family, are they from New York, too? Uh, yes. Okay. And her parents are still up there, probably shoveling snow right now. But, uh, yeah, I think they're getting ready to retire in the next couple of years, and I'm, I'm not sure what their plans are just yet. I got you. They're shoveling snow, and we're trying to stay dry, man, in North Carolina. Yeah. So it's just <laughs> – <laughs> it's hit and miss, my friend. Thank you so much for sharing about your family. I know I was talking to you recently, and you said your son was teething. I said, man, just hang in there, buddy. Just hang in there. Yeah, that's still going on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough times, man. Those days don't last long. They definitely they go in a blink of an eye, and I know you're enjoying every minute of it, man. Oh, absolutely. Very cool, very cool. Now, we started doing something, Mike, that I think you'll, you'll have some fun with. We call it the lightning round. I just asked a bunch of random stuff. And let our listeners know a little bit more about you as the person, man. So you cool with playing that? Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. So let's start with the easy stuff. What's your favorite food? Probably pizza, I'd have to say. Okay. So you're a pizza guy. How about adult beverage? I, I like a good craft beer. Craft beer. Is there? Do you have a favorite? Uh, I've, I've come to like uh, Lone Rider. I live pretty close to the brewery, so I, you know, I go by and get a growler every once in a while of whatever the latest is that they have there. Okay. Now, where is that at? So it's off of uh, Westgate Road in Raleigh, okay, which oh. is uh, pretty close to Briar Creek. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with that one. I have to check that one out, man. Okay, very cool. So how about, uh, what's your favorite music? <laughs> Lately, especially I'm, I'm doing a programming project, I'll put on uh, like like a, like a jazz music in the background. If I'm listening to something with lyrics when I'm programming, it just throws off my concentration. <laughs> <laughs> so you just got to have that, that more of a, just that noise in the background, right? Yeah. I hear you. Okay, okay. What about where's somewhere you've never been, but you that you hope to go one day? I think the Grand Canyon. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, that that that's on that's on my list too for sure. How about one of the best places that you have been that really stands out in your mind? For me, it was probably the I probably say Saint Lucia. I went there with my wife for our honeymoon, and it was just beautiful. Okay, okay. That sounds like a great time. How about pets, man? Dogs, cats, other? What what are you saying there? Yeah, we got a dog. He's uh, yeah, 12 years old now. He's uh, like a lab pug chow beagle mix, but he looks like a lab puppy. Okay. So he's, he's got a little spunk in him still. Very good. So you guys always, have you always had a, a dog? Uh, yeah, he's been with me and my wife here for, for the duration of his life for all, all 12 years. Okay, very cool. And man. then growing up, we had a dog in the house too as well. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm with you, buddy. I I love having my animals around myself, and they make it a lot of fun, you know? So how about, let's see here, last question. If you want to take your wife out, where are you going to go out for a date that night? What are you, what are you doing? Probably sushi. That's her thing. I, I like it, too. Don't get me wrong, but that's, I know that's something she, she really enjoys. Okay. Now, where where do you got any of your favorite sushi places around? Because I, I know my wife, she listens to these hero conversations, and she's a big uh, sushi fan herself, so... We may steal your answer here and pick that one night. So we, yeah, we've had a lot of success with a place called Kai off of uh, Lead Mine Road in Raleigh. Okay. Okay. Good stuff, huh? Oh, absolutely. Nice, nice. Yeah, we'll have to check that one out. We got a couple in Wake Forest that we uh, frequent uh, quite, quite often. So thank you for playing the lightning round, my friend. That was a lot of fun, buddy. Oh, yeah. Very good, Mike. So, look, th we call it Eco Ask Why, and the why talks about the passion. And 
I'd love to know for you as the plant electrical engineer, as, as the, the husband, the dad that you are, what is your personal why, Mike? Uh, for me, I guess coming to work every day, I do it so I can go home and do what I want to do with my family and, and you know, make sure I take good care of them. But, you know, while, while I'm here, I just I really enjoy solving problems and, and helping people. And uh, being the plant electrical engineer it lets me do that pretty much every single day. So sometimes it's a couple of minor thing where there's a hiccup on the machine or sometimes it's more of a, a long term thing where it's either a process problem or a potential you know, safety concern that gets identified where we have to engineer a solution. But that, that's really what I enjoy doing is helping other people and solving problems. And yeah, I'm fortunate enough to get to do that every day. No doubt you do, buddy. You do a great job of it, and it's been a pleasure in my career ever since I met you and had the pleasure of meeting you and learning more about Certain Seed and what you guys do. And I always enjoy whenever my calendar says on there I get to go to Certain Seed. That's a fun day, man. Thank you. You're definitely one of our heroes, Mike, and appreciate you taking the time to share your story. I know you're a busy guy, but I think this would be impactful for so many people, my friend. I hope so, yeah. I thank you for... <laughs> being persistent as far as following up and it was a lot of fun and you know, we appreciate everything eco does for us here as well and we know you guys have been very helpful throughout our history together and we thank you for that absolutely sir well i hope you have a great day and, and get to enjoy those kids this weekend absolutely you do the same stay dry all right thank you mike all right thanks take care thank you for listening to eco ask why this show is supported ad free by electrical equipment company ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.